I think we finished with a bang uh, 2022 with number of events and uh, we are continuing the tradition. We had I think maximum number of events in December uh, that is continuing in January too and uh, why I started 2-3 minutes earlier is uh, quickly I will tell you what is happening in the month of uh, January so that till the people still uh, enjoying the refreshments uh, so that they can come. Tomorrow uh, again very interesting event, Decarbonizing India, Charting the Pathway for Sustainable Growth and we have again excellent panel, Naveen Unni is the author of a book uh, on decarbonization, uh, it's a report by McKinsey, we have got a very high profile panel, Rav Chandan Purushottaman, President of Danforce, uh, Kanaka Sabhabadi Subramaniam is the Senior Vice President of uh, Ashok Leland, he is also in charge of EV area there and Arun Kumar Sambat, the Principal Consultant TCS, so this is happening tomorrow evening. On the 10th, uh, we have again green, we have been throwing too much of green this month. Uh, towards the green economy, we have Professor Janaka Rajan uh, the, is there and we have Arjun Bhargava, consultant of UN Global Compact and Shankar M. Vedugobal, president of uh, Mahindra Wealth City. Then we also have 19th of January, Read and Grow. As usual, we strongly believe mainly doing it for the students. Uh, if you are a good leader, you need to be a good reader. Uh, this time, very interesting subject. The, the Ignite Game by Simon Snake and this, uh, again we have got a very good panel, uh, Vijay Lakshmi, Hari Krishna and Babu Krishna Murthy. Then on uh, Friday 20th January, please, please note this one, this very, very important event, not to be missed even, this one, private booking is mandatory. We have Mr. Manish Tiwari, uh, Country Manager, Indian Consumer Business, Amazon India. He is going to be coming and talking to us on very, very important subject. Uh, it's a third V. Narayan Memorial Endowment Lecture. And he is going to be talking about how e-commerce is transforming retail in India, giving wings to entrepreneurship. We expect a large number of people to come and attend this event along with Pons Veterans. If you want to attend, do register. And uh, I think I, you can walk miles to listen to Mr. Manish, another brilliant mind in retail industry. 24th, we have uh, again event uh, not to be missed. I, I know you love to listen to her, at least I love, love to watch her in television. Uh, well left. And the speaker is none other than Bharati Baska. She is a, a motivational speaker. Uh, uh, she is going to be talking about the subject well left. What does it mean by well left? I asked her. She means uh, well left. India Pakistan final match, you saw Ashwin, the ball, he left it. He got one run and he got one more ball to play. Next ball, he hit the six and uh, won the match. She says in your life, sometimes you leave it well left and it does a lot of good to your life. And she want to give a lot of anecdotes, you know, uh, ba you know Bharati Bhaskar is an outstanding speaker. You will enjoy the evening. It's uh, under Women Business Forum. You are doing this on 24th of January. And on 27th of January, again, not to be missed event, is over the barrel, your perspective on oil industry, oil markets and its geopolitical drivers. And we have got again an outstanding speaker, Mr. Elango, Managing Director of Industrial Oil Exploration Company and he will be in conversation with Shanka, Founder Camps and Director Access Investment. Then on Monday 30th, we started again the new year, the Tamil program which we committed to you, uh, Management Technique in Tirukkural. This will be happening every month and the first uh, speaker uh, will be Mr. Sundramurthy, he is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Tanjai Tamil University, Vice Chairperson of Central Institute of classical Tamil, so we have got uh, everything. And we also program lined up till uh, end of March and I don't know to take my time and uh, we all come to a very interesting event and uh, maybe another meet. We have a couple of events as our reach out program, we are doing a number of locations uh, uh, to the, the similar programs in Chennai. We are doing one at uh, Bhupati and Co, we are doing at um, Mahindra Will City and also uh, at Andhra Chamber of Commerce where we are doing a mind, body and business. They were also doing an event at uh, recent trends uh, in coal, uh, goal setting at Indian Institute of Material Management and improving workplace performance through empowering at Gumri Pundi. And we have almost 10, 12 locations we do MMA outreach program. Please do come. And coming to today's event, this is very, very dear to each one of us and very dear to our committee members and very dear to one of our senior vice, uh, one of our vice president of the committee, building a robust academic entrepreneurial ecosystem. Before that, let me warmly welcome all the viewers watching this program live from all over uh, India and also all the academicians and professors who are watching the program on our request. Uh, as usual, if you have any questions, please do put, send your question to the numbers which is flashed on your screen. We will compile them and place it before uh, the panel to respond to all your questions. I request you to kindly address your questions only relevant to the theme today. And building a robust academic entrepreneurial ecosystem and uh, we have two outstanding person who will be uh, there discussing on the subject ladies and gentlemen put your together and welcome uh, v shankar founder of camps and director access investment limited and the distinguished uh, speaker for this evening professor ashwin magalingam faculty and department of civil engineering iit madras 
Mr. Shankar will be leading the conversation with Ashwin. May I request Ashwin and Mr. Shankar to please take your place on the dais. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to the practical briefing. Most of you know Mr. Shankar uh, very well, but it's my proud privilege to introduce him again and this subject and I also thank him at the beginning itself. He's the one who facilitated this talk and which is very relevant. Uh, you all know we don't want to talk about entrepreneurial ecosystem and how the startup, we are the popularly known all over the world. People are really rushing to India for startup and many students are wanting to do that, but they don't know where the avenue how to go about. Let me have the privilege of introducing Mr. Shankar. Uh, Shankar uh, is a founder of CAMS and also director of Access Investment Private Limited. Shankar is from IIT Madras and I am Kolkata and graduate. We worked briefly with, uh, went on to found his own entrepreneurial thing, CAMS, uh, at, a, at a very early age, Computer Age Management Services Private Limited. In 1998, uh, to provide a platform and services to the Indian mutual fund industry, CAMS was also recently interested, most of you know about it. He is involved in several organizations that promote entrepreneurship and as uh, uh, will as well as both in uh, the Alva matter. And Shankar personally uh, he is a part of our vice president of MMM and he does a lot of help to us in terms of putting things together and driving us to bring the best in us. And I personally thank Shankar for all the support uh, and his endeavor in making MMA function what it is today. I want to Shankar to introduce the speaker in the context. Please. Over to you, Mr. Shankar. Thank you, Vijay. And some young gentleman sitting next to me. Difficult to believe he's a professor, but he is a professor of civil engineering in IIT Madras. Also my alma mater. So I have a particular fondness for the institution as well as for him. I know him, his wife, his family. Uh, he uh, graduated from IIT Madras, then did his uh, PhD in Stanford. Rather, he did his MTech and PhD in Stanford. Came back to IITM and joined as faculty there in 2006. So he's been there for about 15, 16 years now as faculty. He uh, is an expert in the area of uh, projects, engineering projects, and he serves on committees related to that field. Now, if you want to know more, he's all over Google, so you can just Google him. I don't want to waste time on things which are publicly available. Now, you know, today's topic, why am I, what is interesting about this topic? We talk about uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? And we are all aware of uh, incubators, or at least we know the terms incubators, accelerators, angel investors, etc., etc. But we mo know more about them in the public context, not so much in the academic con context. So that such an ecosystem could completely exist end to end within an academic institution is uh, a rarity. And uh, a singular-minded focus on the path of IIT Madras for the last 10, 12 years has led to the situation where there is a complete ecosystem of entrepreneurship within IIT Madras, which not only includes students who are some of the entrepreneurs, but also involves a large number of faculty there, who are also entrepreneurs in addition to being faculty. You'll be surprised that about 30-40% of the faculty in IIT Madras are founders of some startup or the other, the association with students of theirs. How did this come to happen? Why has it not happened in so many other institutions in India? There is something unique about this. There is some secret sauce over there. And that is what we will try and unravel to the best extent possible. And we hope that if there are people from other educational institutions either here or watching, please take away lessons from here because this is a model worth emulating. And unless we do this in various institutions, the spirit of technical entrepreneurship will not start. See, IIT Madras, the speciality is that it's a deep tech crucible. The, the, the startups that come from there are not so much e-commerce and so on, but they are more into things like battery, EV, uh, robotics, things like that, in which India is very poor in general. Anyway, uh, it so happens that around the time 2006 when he joined IIT, or soon thereafter, is when this entire experiment in entrepreneurship started in IIT. So in a sense, he was, his timing of his joining was also fortunate. He also has a personal interest in the subject. And so it sort of all clicked together that he was uh, at the forefront of every initiative in entrepreneurship that was done in IIT Madras. He's uh, been through the grind, 
of course, now he is not really looking after, there are many other people looking after him, but he has set up and sort of initialized all the little pieces that form the ecosystem of entrepreneurship. But you know, I must say that, uh, like many of you, I was also in the very beginning, the system, ecosystem is a big word and we don't really, uh, unless you deconstruct it and explain what, what elements constitute this ecosystem, uh, it's not easy to understand what it is. So I will first start with that, Ashwin. Welcome to this uh, session. What is this ecosystem we keep talking about? <laughs> Can you just put it up on screen and tell us what it is? Yeah, so uh, before I do that, let me start off by wishing you, Shankar, and everyone here a very happy new year. Uh, so I was uh, thrilled to see that this is the first MMA event of the new year. So hopefully uh, it will be all, uh, you know, roses and sunshine from here, although you seem to have a, a set of wonderful events coming up as well. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I think this is a very interesting topic uh, that I'm very happy to discuss. Um, let me start off by saying I don't think we have solved the uh, entrepreneurial academic ecosystem puzzle completely. I think we've made some advances, uh, but there are also areas that I think uh, we need to uh, sort of advance in. So um, I'll spend the next hour or so in conversation trying to tell you a little bit about what we did, how we've did, uh, done it and so on. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll take it from there. So this is more of a knowledge sharing experience. Um, <coughs> Generally, when, when we were putting this event together, I think there were two choices. One is, uh, you know, I could give a, a presentation, uh, you know, a lecture, and it was uh, sort of wonderfully done. You had uh, 75 minutes. I'm used to giving lectures for at least 50 minutes. So it was uh, sort of the perfect sweet spot. But uh, 5 o'clock in the evening, 6 o'clock in the evening, I wasn't quite sure how receptive people would be to death by PowerPoint. So I thought it would be nice to have this as a conversation. However, I do have one slide that I would like to show on our uh, ecosystem, just to give everyone a, um, you know, a sort of a, just, just to set baselines on what we have going on, and then we can start discussing about the nitty gritties. So if um, that one slide could come up, is there a way in which I can, uh, yeah, if I can just, because there's some animation on this slide. Thank you. So it's actually, I'm cheating a little bit, it's three slides, but one is the title and the third is the thank you, so there's really only one uh, substantive slide. Okay. So, um, all right, so what does our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem look like, okay? Um, this is my perspective on what it looks like, depending on which angle you look at, the, the picture will be slightly different, but more or less, um, you know, this is, this is what it is. We have four parts to our ecosystem, okay? The first part is uh, the ideation part, right? It's the part where ideas get generated. And this is, of course, the critical part of any entrepreneurship ecosystem, because we don't have ideas. Uh, then you don't have companies, right? So the ideation part is a critical part of our ecosystem. Uh, the second part of our ecosystem is what we call the pre-incubation part where we test ideas, right? Because not every idea necessarily lends itself into being an entrepreneurial venture, right? And in fact, um, you know, you can read all about statistics uh, where, you know, possibly about 10 or 15 percent of good ideas actually lend themselves towards uh, being good businesses, right? So we have a pre-incubation part where we actually stress test those ideas. Once you've stress tested, you have some kind of a filter and you have a number of ideas that pass that stress test and come out at the other end of the pipe, we actually have an incubation segment to our ecosystem where we say, okay, here's an idea that could potentially be an entrepreneurial venture, potentially be a successful venture. Let's do what we can to support it. And I can talk a little bit more about what it is we do, but that's a, a, a third segment. And a fourth segment is all of these support activities we do to enable these three segments. Right? So how do we support ideation, pre-incubation, incubation? Right? So this is the way we conceptually, or at least I conceptually map out our ecosystem. So let me go through each of these segments, tell you what we have going on. Ideation, um, I'll start from maybe the middle. Uh, there are a number of research labs at IIT Madras, a number of faculty doing research. And so there are ideas that just come out in the normal practice of doing business at IIT, right? the normal sort of research activities that we carry out. Um, and in parallel, you have students who essentially are thinking creatively as well, right? So they're sitting in their hostels, having conversations with other students, trading ideas. So that's again a little bit of a hotbed of, uh, of innovation and, and creative ideas, primarily because you have students from different backgrounds all sitting together and conversing. So that the co-location factor is extremely important. And I'll come back to this later, but I think being a residential institute 
has its own benefits here because you know once you're done with classes at five o'clock or whatever, people don't go back, right? They actually come together, you know, in their hostels, etc., and spend. I mean, if uh, Shankar and my experience is any barometer, at least until one or two in the morning talking about something and some of those conversations are actually productive. So that's one part that we already had going on that many of you might have going on as well, right? And uh, at the bottom we have this industrial consultancy and sponsored research cell which incidentally is celebrating its 50th year this year, uh, which allows us not only to do research theoretically in our own spaces but also collaborate with industry to do research. So very often industry comes to IIT and say I have this problem. Uh, is there some research that can help or can I fund some research that would help? And so these are ways in which, uh, in which innovation happens. But at the top, we have something that I think is a little bit different from what most people have and it's this, uh, this entity that we call the Center for Innovation. How many of you um, are engineers or studied engineering? Just raise your hands. Okay, relatively few, but that's okay. See, when you're studying engineering, one of the uh, courses that nobody likes when they are studying, but which they love to talk about many years later and tell war stories about, is this thing called workshop, right? When you're doing workshop, nobody really likes workshop, right? Because it's, it's sort of hot, it's dusty, you're doing all of these things with your hands, etc. cetera. Um, but that's a little bit sad because the workshop is the only time in an engineering education where you actually do something with your hands. The rest of it is all theoretical, you're solving equations on paper, you're writing some computer program, right? The only time you're actually making something is in a workshop. And unfortunately, the workshops that we have uh, in most of our engineering colleges don't lend themselves towards, uh, you know, innovation and creativity, they're very structured. So at some point, uh, you know, we came up with this idea of, of creating a workshop that would be, you know, by the students, of the students, for the students kind of workshop, right? Completely managed by students where students could do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, okay? And this is what we call the Center for Innovation. Very generously, the batch of 1981, the alumni of 1981, a batch to whom Shankar belongs, generously funded, uh, you know, this center. And we actually now have a laboratory where the tagline is walk in with an idea, walk out with a product, right? So it's no holds barred. Any student can go in, you've got all kinds of equipment machines available, you can do what you want. There are already existing groups, students are building race cars, they're building rovers that will hopefully, uh, uh, you know, uh, travel on Mars or whatever it is. You can join an existing group, you can start your own group. It doesn't matter if you're a civil engineer, you can join the robotics group. It doesn't matter if you're a, uh, you know, chemical engineer, you can start making drones, no rules at all, okay? And this is, uh, you know, and the funny thing is, People say, when should I go visit the Center for Innovation? When will I see all this hustle and bustle of activity? And I tell them at 3 o'clock. And they say, okay, 3 p.m., right? And I say, no, 3 a.m., right? Because that's when all the students are out there, um, you know, just sort of innovating. And the Center for Innovation has just been this wonderful melting pot of students who, you know, all your baggage in terms of the branch you're in, the place you're from, etc., gets left behind. And, uh, you know, they just have the freedom to, to do whatever without this specter of a grade looming over your head, right? Saying, I need to do this in order to get a grade or whatever. So the Center for Innovation is one of our hotbeds of idea generation, okay? So these are the things we have going on where ideas get generated, all right? But ideas, of course, are a dime a dozen. What happens when ideas get generated, okay? So that's where we move to the uh, second part of the ecosystem, which is the pre-incubation part. Um, we have this program called Nirmat. Okay, which we started a few years ago, where we said, you've got all these guys in the Center for Innovation innovating, but they all just innovate, right? They enter student competitions, sometimes they patent a little bit about what they're doing, but then they graduate and move on, right? Why don't we try to see if there are some of these uh, ideas that have commercial potential, some of these students who are uh, you know, interested in exploring the commercial potential, and we'll put them through a one-year program, where they'll take this idea that they've been working on, this thing that they've been building, and try to see if there is actually a business behind it. So Nirman is a pre-incubation program. We bring in students, typically a cohort of about 10 or 15 teams a year. Uh, a team could have two people, three people, etc. They're already working on the technology. They're working on the idea, um, right? And what we do is we help them think through the business side of it. We try to sort of figure out what a business model is, what a business plan is. We try to get them to go and speak to some customers potentially. We have a lot of alumni coming in and mentoring them. The idea being that by the time you graduate, you can make a decision and the decision can be this idea works, I want to start a business or I've tried this idea 
it doesn't seem to work, no regrets, I'll go on do something else. But at least you have clarity in your mind. And we're hoping that there will be some fraction of students that come into Nirman who say, okay, let me start this business. And some of our more successful startups today have actually come through this pipeline. We also have something called an innovation ecosystem project where we tell faculty, look, if you're working on something innovative, right, don't stop with publishing a paper. If you're interested in patenting it, come to us, we'll give you a little bit of funding, try to see if we can take your research to something that can be patented and potentially then commercialize. And we've now restarted this new pro this program called MS in Entrepreneurship, where we tell faculty, one of the problems is faculty have wonderful ideas, we do a lot of research, but where is the bandwidth to become an entrepreneur, right? Entrepreneurship is at least two full-time jobs at the same time. As a faculty, I already have my research to do, my teaching to do, administrative functions, maybe I do a little bit of consulting. I have no time to start a company. So we tell faculty, look, we, we have this program where if you have an idea that's commercializable, we will help you find a potential student who will come in and do a master's in entrepreneurship. The master's here is not research, right? The output here is not a thesis. The output of this is a business plan, is a validated business plan, right? So once they work on your technology and they have a validated business plan, um, uh, right? That's when they finish the master's and hopefully by that time they're involved enough that they actually become entrepreneurs, right? So that is a new program that we've started. By the way, I can see several students here. These are programs that you can, by the way, apply for. The MS and entrepreneurship is something that you can apply for after you graduate. Every six months, we put down a list of projects that uh, faculty have and the kind of people that they're looking for. Sometimes they're looking for people with a technical background. Sometimes they're looking for people with more of a liberal arts or an economics or a management background to work on on the entrepreneurial side of the business, right? So all of you are welcome to apply to that program. Okay, so this is what we have going on in pre-incubation. So you can test your idea through Nirman, through the MS in Entrepreneurship Program and so on. And you know, you might find that it has success potential, you might find that it, it does not. Um, and then recently we've got this, uh, you know, we started this center called the Gopal Krishnan Deshpande Center, named after two of our eminent alumni, Chris Gopal Krishnan and Desh Deshpande, uh, who funded this, where we sort of say, look, we focus on one thing and we focus on this thing called customer discovery. Right. Who are your customers? So very simply put, it's a seven week program where we force you to talk to a hundred customers, right? And come back and decide who exactly is your customer, what should your product look like in order for that customer to buy it, product, service, whatever it is you're doing. So these are all the things that you can do while you're a student, uh, right? To stress test your idea, okay? And lastly, we have this thing called the entrepreneurship cell, which I am currently the faculty in charge of. It's completely student run. And the entrepreneurship cell evangelizes entrepreneurship, right? So we bring in eminent people from uh, the entrepreneurship world to give talks to our students. We run competitions uh, so that students can actually test their ideas, pitches in front of an audience of VCs. I know at least a, a couple of you here have been a part of this. So that's again another activity that we have going on. So all of this helps people move from idea to, uh, you know, to potential venture. Once you've stress tested, you come out of say Nirman and you say this works, right? I found a few customers, right? The economics seem to be working out. I really want to start. Then we push you into the, uh, uh, I wonder if my sort of, uh, yeah, picture. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we actually start incubating. We have uh, the, the main incubator, which we call the IIT Madras incubation cell. And then we have a few thematic incubators, which are in a sense, in a sense, sub-incubators. They're all part of the IIT Madras incubation cell. Uh, the one that looks like a bee in green is, is our bio incubator that focuses specifically, specifically on biotech. RTBI is a rural technology business incubator. Again, as the name suggests, focuses on rural technology. And the last one is the health technology uh, innovation center, which focuses on med tech, okay? But whatever doesn't come under this ambit goes straight to the incubation cell. What does the incubation cell do? The incubation cell does a few things. One, uh, it provides you some space, right? So you have a desk, you have a power connection, you have an internet connection. So you can actually start doing what it is uh, you're doing, right? So it provides that. It provides a little bit of seed funding, uh, right? A little bit as a grant, a little bit as a loan, uh, so that you can actually hire a few people, you can get something manufactured, fabricated, etc. cetera, uh, right? Um, it, of course, provides a bit of a brand. I mean, if you're an IIT Madras incubated company, that might stand for something when you go in and talk to a customer, that might matter. Um, but it also provides a lot of mentorship, right? Mentorship can come through uh, a faculty at IIT, mentorship can come through alumni, right? So if you're part of the IIT Madras incubation cell, right, you have access to all of these. You have access to some amount of technical support from IIT naturally. 
right? But also some amount of funding, some amount of mentorship, and access to a lot of hygiene services, right? So I've talked about internet, desk, etc. But also we have tie-ups with uh, uh, with uh, legal agencies, human resource agencies. So you want, you've got an employee, you want to write an employment contract. You don't have to break your head doing it, right? We'll connect you with somebody who will do it at a relatively subsidized rate. You want to file your tax returns at the end of the year, right? You don't have to break your head doing that. We'll connect you to people doing this. So you can focus on running your business, right? And in order to do this, right, we have a number of people who support us, right? Um, around about 10 years ago, we had this organization that the alumni created called the IITM EF, the IIT Madras Entrepreneurship Forum, um, right? Where a number of alumni came together and said, we will support uh, incubation at IIT Madras, which means we will mentor you in a, in a number of different ways. I might be able to technically mentor you because your startup has something to do with manufacturing. I've been in manufacturing for three decades. Or I might just be, you know, what we call a journey mentor, right? Sort of like an agony aunt or an agony uncle on whose shoulder you can cry on. Entrepreneurship is really tough, right? Every entrepreneur goes through, in the initial stages, more downs than ups. Right? They get dejected, uh, right? they want to quit, things like that. So you need somebody who can talk you through that. All right? And so we have alumni doing this. We have alumni saying, I can connect you to people right, who might potentially be your customers or connect you to people who you might want to recruit. So a, a lot of support is provided by our alumni. And we also have uh, connections with, uh, you'll recognize some of these logos, Tai, the Indus Entrepreneurs, the Kirutsu Forum. These are essentially uh, you know, forum, entrepreneur forums or angel investor forums. Uh, right, where people interface with us and support our ecosystem. So essentially, this is what our ecosystem looks like currently. We have all of these moving pieces, essentially focused on trying to get ideas, uh, test them, and sort of scale them, right? So they become successful businesses. So a bit of a long-winded answer, and this is my one slide. So I'll stop here. Maybe I'll just leave this slide here, yeah. because in the course of the yeah. conversation, we'll come back to it. Thank you, Vashan. That was a very, very clear explanation. You know, a completed building always looks very nice, like this. But uh, it is while construction is going on that it's an enormous mess. And this was also, I'm sure, constructed. It didn't miraculously appear one day in its full-fledged form. So, and this construction has obviously taken a decade or more. But before I get into that, I just want to give a little backstory on the C5 because as Ashwin said, we were the batch responsible for funding it. Uh, 2006 was our 25th reunion uh, since we passed. So we met at the institute and uh, you know the older you go you get a little sentimental so we said we have to do something for the institute. We looked around and uh, that was the time when the institute had uh, provided internet connections at the hostels. Around the time, maybe a year or so ago. Massive leap. When we were in the institute, we did not even have calculators. We had something called lock tables and slide rules. You may not know. Anyway, internet was just being introduced into the hostel rooms. And to the great horror of us alumni, we found students were just sitting in the rooms and playing games with each other. So I would be here and you would be in the next room. And we would be playing games on the computer with each other. Nobody played any sport. Because internet was new and computer games caught everybody's fancy. So we said, this is ridiculous. We can't have a society where everybody sits in rooms and plays computer games with each other. And uh, I think, uh, as Ashwin briefly pointed out, I have a much stronger view on that. I think that in the last 10 years, the entire IT revolution has done a lot for, for, for the country, but it has done something bad also. It has sucked away all the actual engineers. So every engineer who graduates in any field, even aeronautical engineering, his aspiration is I want to join one IT company and become an engineer. The, the engineering is just a paper qualification to get into the IT institute. What that has resulted in 10 years down the road is that there is a huge vacuum of engineers who actually do engineering. So if you want to find an actual mechanical engineer or a civil engineer or you know an automobile engineer, it's a really tough job. You have to find them from the Gulf and bring them here. That is how it is. So I think that uh, all these factors played in our mind, which is why we set up uh, C5 then as a, as a playroom as a place where some equipment is there and you fool around and do what you want with your hands. That was an aside. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, 15 years or 20 years down the road, uh, today if you go to the institute, they will talk about pre-C5 and post-C5 days, almost like AD and BC. They said that, that is the sort of massive difference it has created to the uh, DNA of the institute. So that's one thing I'm proud of, which is why we are spending so much time on this. But coming back to our main topic, you have this fully developed vision over here 
it's got so many little components over here some are relationships some are pieces of infrastructure some are services but all coming together and working beautifully clearly this was a long time in the making you started with something and then you found there was a lack somewhere you built it etc etc and in the process there must have been a lot of challenges a lot of learnings for example as an example of one of the challenges i foresee is that in the days in my days when we wanted to start a business it was like you failed at everything else that is why you are starting a business you could not get a job in a proper company no government would not employ you you failed at ias you failed at everything else vera vai illama you went and started a company adikku the way it was presented was edho panninirukka ama thanave appadi da solluvaangale veya ipo irukira maari oh entrepreneur na right on top of the world everybody else is below that it was not that way at all i am sure things would not have been very vastly different in 2006 and 2007 so starting from there tell me how this whole thing was developed yeah sure thanks i like your analogy to constructing the slide now you know why they got a civil engineering professor to talk about this so, yeah can can we have that slide back uh, please if that's okay i'd like to sort of uh, yeah so this this is uh, you know looks very nice right in retrospect but let me sort of uh, tell you how this slide itself came to be so again if you go to 2006 if you start with the pre c5 days uh maybe the only thing on this slide the uh, the research was was happening uh, right so that small part on the left the iitm research labs hostel that part was there and uh, uh, you know curiously enough of course tai and others were there but they didn't have uh, linkages with us at the time the only other part that was there was interestingly this rtbi rural technology business uh, you know incubator because um, I, i know some of you know or have heard of uh, professor ashok jujunwala um he had actually started up uh, i mean he was an academic with a little bit more of a practical um, you know orientation trying to sort of make products rather than just write research and so he started up this incubator at at that point so that was there and we were learning a lot uh, you know at the time but it was still not many people knew about what was happening in that incubator but that was all that was there maybe pre c5 um big turning point was the center for innovation uh, right and when we set up the center for innovation entrepreneurship was far from our mind that was not the the issue at all as shankar said we set it up for a couple of reasons we set it up because we thought students were just moving away from engineering here is a way in which we could excite them in engineering again they would actually go ahead and do things with their hands and also to get them out of their hostel rooms playing video games with each other etc so the idea was just to get students to innovate so that they would become better engineers not that they would become better entrepreneurs initial thinking but uh, it took on a life of its own um, right i mean it's and it's something that just sort of emerged a bunch of people so you can see how there were a lot of students who were somewhat repressed right they typically in places like iit you take a branch not because you are interested in it but because your rank in the exam allows you only to get into that branch right so i mean i took civil engineering not because i wanted to be a civil engineer my rank couldn't get me anything better if i had been number 1 i would have taken computer science too so a lot of people do things that they are not fundamentally interested in and they sort of go through four years but suddenly they found that here is a place in which they can actually do what they always wanted to do so that part came first okay and then at some point when uh, uh, the our previous director uh, professor baskar ram murthy went to the us to meet alumni alumni said this was roughly about 10 years ago 2012 alumni said what can we do and this is alumni in the us to help you and i think baskar mentioned three things and one of those things was he said look i really see entrepreneurship as the future right so i think there was a bit of a vision uh, that baskar had possibly also because he was associated with the rural technology business incubator and that sort of lit a spark somewhere so the alumni galvanized into this iit madras entrepreneurship forum and said we are here right here's a bunch of alumni in india and in the us and this is our background we worked in these industries we've started these companies etc we are ready to help and at the same time the uh, department of science and technology was starting these uh, these incubators right i think they had this what is the technology development board i forget what that uh, organization was so both of them came together at the same time we started our incubation cell and the entrepreneurship forum came together but still at that point you have an incubation cell you have uh, entrepreneur you know alumni who are ready to mentor but where are the startups right so we had a few we had a few in the hostel some very innovative startups there was this guy who was actually minting money selling notebooks right as in not laptops you know the writing notebooks which had some extremely creative features it had something like a bunk meter 
so you can keep track of how many classes you've bunked and you know all of these things and people in engineering colleges were just you know buying these like hot cake. So we had a few of these kinds of uh, you know guys doing interesting stuff in the hostel coming through, a couple of people doing slightly more you know techy things. Um, but you know at some point this wasn't wrapping up and that's what motivated us to start Nirmat. Right? We said okay now let's take all the creativity here at IIT and start pushing it into some kind of a program, right? So we started Nirman for the students and the innovation ecosystem product project for the faculty, right? And that, that was fine, but then you had 10 students getting into Nirman, five of whom would drop out, three of whom, three of the remaining would see that their projects aren't really worth starting businesses. And at the end of the pipe, you'll have only one or two. So then we had to figure out how to scale Nirman, um, right? And so that's where we, uh, you know, the, the entrepreneurship cell came. And the entrepreneurship cell was, was there for a while. But it had one students, two students, and typically the people who could not get a position in the uh, Sarang organization or the Shastra organization or whatever would come here, right? But slowly the interest ramped up and now it's a 200 strong student body um, where they said, and we said, look, we need to strengthen you guys because you have to evangelize entrepreneurship. Every fresher coming in, right, as soon as they come in, need to be aware that this is an option, that such a thing exists. I went through four years and pretty much Shankar did as well without even knowing that a term called entrepreneurship existed, um, right? And we don't want that to be the case. So the entrepreneurship cell then came next. Um, and with the entrepreneurship cell, a lot of people then started being aware of entrepreneurship, which means more people in C5 and in the hostels, etc., said, let's stress test our ideas through Nirmal. The more we had in terms of a Nirman pipeline going in, the more we had coming out and we had more people coming in. And of course, the incubation cell was also attracting people from outside. Uh, they had funding to set up these thematic incubators, that kind of uh, stuff happened. And uh, so, so that sort of went on for a while. But then we realized that there's a lot of student energy in entrepreneurship. There's not as much faculty uh, energy and uh, involvement. And we always felt that the faculty-oriented startups are probably going to be our, um, uh, let's say, you know, long-term more successful startup because these are based on uh, years of research. This is really based on technology that could be game-changing. I mean, the notebook idea is great, but you know, that's sort of here today, gone tomorrow kind of a kind of a startup, right? Whereas the faculty, you know, uh, robotics or nanotechnology, you know, these kinds of things could uh, could have a lasting impact. How do we bring them in? And that's where, uh, when uh, Chris uh, Gopal Krishnan and Desh Deshpande came together, we said, why don't we start a program where every faculty will try to find a student entrepreneur and go through this, what we call the Innovate program that the GDC uh, conducts, which is this sort of program that helps you start discovering customers. And then you say, oh, I've got some customers, now how do I go further? Can I be a part of Nirman, etc. So that, and, and the MS in Entrepreneurship program, where faculty can hire a student to develop a business model for them, right, as part of a master's project, uh, right, were ways in which we started getting faculty uh, more involved in this process, right, and as a result of which, and then you get to a point where you have a positive feedback cycle, okay. So that's how this sort of slide came to be. I mean, I could have animated it differently instead of going by segment, um, uh, right, I guess I could have animated differently to show you how it came up, but this is more or less how that happened. Um, was it smooth? Not at all. Uh, lots of, uh, like I said, it's taken, you know, I was talking to a, a you know, a professor friend of mine in, uh, who, who is from Israel and I was asking him, where is your family from? And his response was, that depends on how back, how far back in history you want to go, right? So if you sort of, uh, you know, if I want to start talking about this, it also depends a little bit on how far back in history we want to go. Um, there's stuff that we started doing in the mid 80s, right? Uh, shortly after Shankar graduated, uh, you know, where we, some of the, the, the seeds of this uh, system germinated. But I think uh, the, the C5 2006 or maybe even a little bit later, 2010, 2012, when we started our incubator is probably when we had a real inflection point. The incubator came together, the E-cell came together, uh, the IITM EF came together, Nirman came shortly after. Um, so the big challenges in the beginning were trying to convince students and faculty right, that this was even an option. I remember uh, being asked, so the alumni came and said, okay, let's do one. Uh, E-Summit, e we called it, or E-Week, something we called it, right, Entrepreneurship Week or Entrepreneurship Summit, where we'll have a few days just focused on entrepreneurship. We'll have speakers, this, that, etc. Let's get the campus geared towards entrepreneurship. And as part of that, we said we'll have one panel or one workshop where we bring in faculty who are interested in uh, entrepreneurship and let's have a discussion with them on what's stopping them, etc. Right? At the time we had about 550 faculty on campus. I sent out an email 
Nobody responded. Right? Zero RSVPs. Then I had to go to uh, Bhaskar Ramurthy, who was the director, and say, Boss, you have to write an email. And by the way, you have to write a slightly strongly worded email. And on top of that, I will give you a list of names. You have to write separate emails to them and essentially twist their arm to come. And Bhaskar very sportingly did all of this. And about 15 people showed up out of 550. And the 15 who showed up said, when I get promoted from assistant to associate to professor, people ask me how many papers I've published and what's the quality of the journals that I publish them in. Right. Nobody asks me about uh, you know, startups and this and that. Why should I do this? Right? Am I not shooting myself in the foot by concentrating on this rather than that? So the initial perception was, uh, and you know, uh, if you ever talk to Ashok Junjunwala, he will tell you in 2006, somebody came to him and said, Junjunwala, Lakshmi and Saraswati don't mix. Right. This is a, IIT is a place for Saraswati, you are trying to bring Lakshmi in. Right? So, so we have, all of us have these kinds of war stories where people say, this is not what we should be doing. All right. Students looked at us and said, Let, let's go through this again. I've got a 20 lakh sort of per annum job offer and you're telling me that I should start up a company where I have to struggle, I will make no money, I can't even pay myself a salary and three years later 90% chances I'll close down. Right. Now, exactly why do you want me to try this again? Right, so most of these students were like, so initially people were sort of looking at why entrepreneurship, right? So slowly over a period of time, there's no single silver bullet, right? It's about, it's a slow, it's about talking to people, more workshops, role models, right? Once you see one faculty doing really well in a company that, and maybe they make a little bit of an exit, they make a little bit of money, maybe they've got their papers, uh, you know, the, their, their photos or their uh, uh, descriptions flashed over the media because media has picked it up, they win the Economic Times Award or whatever it is, then others start saying, oh wow, I mean, this guy is getting a lot of publicity, maybe I can do the same, right? So it takes a while. Um, you know, convincing the students was not that difficult because there are lots of stories like Flipkart and all of that and people say, okay, you know what, let me try. But convincing the parents of students, right, that was another issue. I've had calls from parents saying, you know, what are you doing? You're corrupting my son or my daughter, right? I sent him or her there because they would get an IIT education. They'll make their way up a nice multinational corporation. And you're talking to them about entrepreneurship. How dare you do that, right? Stop, cease and desist immediately, right? So we've had to deal with parents, right, who call up and say, look, it's not. I was trying to tell them, look, you know, there is free will here. Your son or daughter decided to do this. They say, no, you're responsible. So getting, all, getting the culture built is extremely uh, challenging, time consuming. The only mantra is you've got to keep at it, right? So it has to happen continuously over a period of time. You have just like any entrepreneur, you have a little bit of a thick skin. If only 10 or 15 people showed up to the first faculty meeting, that was fine. Today about 50 or 60 faculty would show up if we had something like that, right? Because the thing has been sort of built in. So uh, yeah, and it, we couldn't have done it if we didn't have all of these moving parts. Right? If we didn't have this entrepreneurship cell, for instance, right, where we just constantly, whether people attended or not, organized events on entrepreneurship. Uh, right? If we didn't have the IIT Madras Entrepreneurs Forum, where a bunch of alumni, at one point the alumni mentors far outnumbered the startups. Uh, right? I mean, typically we expect it to be the other way around, right? where one alumni is mentoring three startups. Um, right? Here we have three alumni vying to mentor one startup because nobody has enough to do. So, but you know, they continued to persist. They said it doesn't matter. Even if companies don't come, we will go there every Friday afternoon, every week or every other week and sit and offer our free mentoring clinic for any company that wants to come. So slowly over a period of time, and the institute also did a wonderful job in terms of publicizing entrepreneurship, which I think was very important. So every time there's a competition or there's some kind of an award, we try to nominate somebody, um, right? And you know, when they win, you publicize it and things like that. Um, you know, we've constantly sort of at least talked about how while, you know, papers, etc., are important, we do sort of give credit to people who do things beyond just, uh, you know, publishing uh, in, in a variety of forums, etc. We have pots of money that are available for research that could be commercialized, things like that, right? So all of those had to come in place, but it has been a tough journey and we are by no means done yet, right? I think there's still a lot of work to do. So I'll stop here. Maybe we can come back to some of these as we... Thank you, Ashwin. I wanted to put some tangibility on this by perhaps uh, calling out a couple of startups that have been successful with Origins and IIT Madras. Uh, how many of you use electric two-wheelers? Anybody here? Aether, anybody? Aether is a company that has its origins in IIT Madras. Uh, Agnikul, uh, 
a company which has printed its first rocket. We had a session like this a year ago where we spoke to the founders of Agnikul, talked about how they are printing, 3D printing rockets. And the first, uh, I think, uh, takeoff is scheduled for later this month. So two of them. You want to add a couple of names? Um, well, there are... Uh there are, well, there are several old and new, I think some of the older ones, uh, Planis does underwater uh, robots that help fix underwater pipelines and dams and things like that. More recently, there's a startup that I was involved with called Modulus Housing that builds foldable houses, which uh, it turned out to be a godsend during COVID because if we wanted to quickly set up some kind of a, a vaccination facility or a clinic or whatever it is, they just you know bring this to the premises, unfold it, and you're up and running. You don't really have to construct um, something like that. So there, there's a number of startups. Um, Aether is, uh, you know, I just wanted to say a couple of words about it because I know both Tarun and Swapnil, the founders, very well. Both of them took a, I used to teach an entrepreneurship class and they took that class with me. So I've known them from then. Uh, interestingly, they both graduated from IIT. Uh, and they went to work, I can't remember, I think it might be with uh, Unilever or I, I can't remember. And then they came back and said, uh, look, what we were doing in the class uh, was far more exciting than what we are doing at Unilever or whatever. So they quit and they came back. Um, and they were our first wave of students that did this. And uh, everyone pitched behind them. At, at that time, I think they would have, uh, I can't remember now, but this would have been about the 2013-14 time frame, I think. Um, nobody really thought it was possible. Nobody really thought we'd have commercial electric vehicles on our streets, especially by a couple of students. People thought these guys would create a technology, some, somebody would come and buy it, you know, buy, buy the, the technology they'd sell, whatever. But, um, but a lot of people threw their weight behind Aether. Um, a number of alumni supported it, so several faculty supported uh, Aether. These guys said, come what may, we are not going to just develop a technology and sell, we're going to build a business. Um, and not only have they done successfully, they've been an inspiration to a lot of other people who say, hey, Tarun was in my hostel, Swapnil was, uh, you know, uh, he and I used to sort of, uh, you know, sit in the mess together, right? So these are guys just like you and me, right? If so they can do it, so can I. So I think Aether and companies in that first generation um, did a really good job of, of doing this. And Tarun and Swapnil, by the way, but Tarun was one of the student presidents of the E-Cell when he was here. Um, right, and so not only did he take from, uh, the experience in the E cell, running the E cell, helped him, but he also gave back in terms of evangelizing all of this uh, throughout the institute. So it's a little bit of there's a lot of synergies that are required. It's not just one intervention or one path that you go through. Yeah, I think the, there has been a lot of luck in this also. That many things have fallen in place at the right time. We've had a couple of successes amongst the early entrepreneurs. And all that has resulted in a positive feedback loop. Very good. Now, I want to move away from a strict analysis of the IITM entrepreneurship ecosystem into the ecosystem in India itself for entrepreneurship. And uh, you know, since uh, new director Kamakoti has taken over about a couple of months back, the emphasis at IIT has been to take what IIT has done into the world at large. You should not have to write a JEE and get a high rank in order to get into IIT. Even without that, there must be an option to partake of the IIT education and the IIT ecosystem. That is the no current intention of IIT Metas and indeed all IITs. Democratizing education. Along those lines, a number of initiatives take, have taken place. There is a BSc online course. Number of online courses which are available uh, pretty much to anybody for the asking. You don't have to sit through three years of that course. You can sit through one year and go away with uh, you know a degree, not a degree, a diploma, two years with something else and three years with a full degree. So, uh, trying to democratize education and uh, trying to create a la carte uh, menus of courses which you can combine together uh, based on what your interest is and so on. So, a lot of very interesting things happening in education and IIT Madras is at the forefront of that. I will ask Ashwin to speak about education itself, democratizing of education itself, but I will also ask him to speak about this ecosystem that we have developed for entrepreneurship. That is itself worth propagating to other institutions and try to help them to create or co-create ecosystems like this in their respective institutes. So, first about democratizing education out of IITM and second about taking the entrepreneurship ecosystem elsewhere. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, I'm also a firm believer in democratizing education. I don't think, you know, just your performance in that one very tough exam should include or exclude you from education uh, uh, primarily. 
and uh, and education is something that actually scales very well right so you know if i'm going to teach you you know i don't know mathematics probability whether it's 20 people sitting in front of me or 200 people and sitting in front of me um, you know i can still teach the same thing right so it scales very nicely and i think we've uh, over over uh, over several years actually starting from the time of professor anant who was uh, there were two directors ago and then baskar and then kamakoti now we've sort of worked on it kama of course is is trying to really ramp it up you've heard of uh, initiatives perhaps like anaivarukum iatm which is trying to bring it to everybody um, since professor anand's time we've had this platform called the np tel platform the national program for technology enhanced learning where iit madras as well as other iits where as well as other uh, i guess what we call cfti centrally funded technical institutes put their courses up online and there are a, a number of ways you can just view it you can actually take the course and write an exam and get some credit for it uh, if you take if you credit a few courses then you can actually apply for a certificate and say oh i actually now have a certificate in water resources or in environmental studies or in robotics or whatever it is all right and so the idea is you know if you want to learn i don't thermodynamics or whatever it is right um you shouldn't be limited by the particular college that you're in and the quality of the professor who's in front of you right so you should be able to get uh, the best education possible and by the way for many of these subjects you will find multiple courses on nptel right so you can decide to take thermodynamics with this iit karakpur professor or turn about thermodynamics with the banaras hindu university iit bhu professor right so you can decide that this one's better than that so the idea is that this should be accessible to everybody the online bsc program is a little bit of a next step where nptel is free for all right any of you can register you can take one courses you you one course you can take a few courses and by the way it's not just engineering right because i know many of you are not engineers you have courses in uh, in the pure sciences you have courses in the social sciences you have courses in management operations research a lot of things are out there so you haven't seen the nptel offering please go and google uh, you know nptel and and see what we have but uh, but and so like i was saying nptel is a bit free for all you can take one course you can audit it you can do whatever you want the online bsc program was intended to be a little bit more structured where you do everything online but there's actually a curriculum there are actually a series of courses that you take in some sequence just like you would take a degree program um, and at the end of it we actually give you a degree not just a certificate or a diploma in this case right um differences between the traditional program and this are you can take it at your own pace right so you don't have to finish in 3 years or 4 years you can take your time um, right so you'll find that a lot of people join at the same period of time some people finish in 2 years some people finish in 3 years some people finish in 4 years depends on how much time and how much uh, bandwidth uh, you have uh, and also you can drop out at various stages of the program you can drop out after a year and probably get a certificate you can drop out after a couple of years and get a diploma you can drop out after uh, you know a little bit and if you complete the program you actually get a, a bsc degree from iit madras right so it's a little bit more flexible but it isn't free for all you have to go through some kind of a of a structure and that's working out really well there is a little bit of an entry bar um, right there is there is a qualifying test but it's far far easier than the joint entrance uh, entrance examination and it's it's uh, it's lovely i mean if at some point you talk to the people who are running it my colleague andrew who's also my batchmate uh, incidentally who runs the nptel program will tell you stories about uh, the daughter of a fruit seller you know a fruit cart seller in ahmedabad who uh, actually took this program right and and has successfully completed either all of it or most of it and essentially says look there was just no way that i could study data science because my father essentially runs a push cart uh right and sells vegetables but now that this is online uh, right and i have access i've actually become a data scientist right so uh, so very heartwarming stories of that kind also very interesting stories about uh, you know there is no age bar right you don't have to do this when you're 17 so we actually have uh, mother and son pairs taking the course at the same time and competing with each other to see who would get the higher grade and stuff like that so it so lots of possibilities that the online bsc program uh, has given us uh, as a way to democratize now many of us including and this is something that i'm working on um, at least the first part of uh, 2023 is trying to make a lot of say the civil engineering offerings online so uh, i'm a civil engineer there's a lot of infrastructure being built a lot of construction happening a lot of those people who are constructing um right and essentially learning on the job and they would love to have to go through sort of an iit curated 6 month program to really understand a little bit more about concrete and you know construction technology and so on 
uh, they did, were not able to get into the IIT through the JEE. They probably don't have time now to come for a two years master's program. But we're trying to see if we can offer a six month online certification program for all of these people. So anybody who's working on say infrastructure, right, can take this and know and learn a little bit more about construction techniques, quality, materials, planning, things like that. Similarly, there's a program we've launched on electric vehicles. So there are a number of programs that are being launched, certification programs that, that anyone can take. So all of this is a, is a continued effort uh, in terms of trying to take what we have and democratize it and offer it for, uh, for everybody. Right? If you want to do research at IIT Madras, I mean, you probably still have to qualify to come in. But if you just want to learn what we have to teach, that should just be available. And it's not completely available yet, but we're moving in that direction. On, uh, if I can move on to the second uh, uh, part, which is, okay, so how are we democratizing the entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem? We're doing a couple of things. One, at the, uh, uh, you know, on the left side of this picture, on the ideation and pre-incubation side, we are trying to help colleges set up CFIs and ESETs, um, right? So we have a playbook, right? And, and you know, I like to say now that ESEL has 200 people, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, in the beginning, we were just floundering, trying to attract students. We didn't know what kind of uh, events to hold, what would attract people. We've learned. We have a playbook in terms of how should an ESEL be organized? Right, what kind of events uh, you know, would really, would you like to run? How would you run those kinds of events? How would you sequence those through the course of a year so there is some progression for a student who wants to get into entrepreneurship? Similarly, with the Center for Innovation, you know, depending on the size of the facility you have, how would you start? What kinds of machinery would you put in? What kind of clubs would you start? How would you organize it? How would you allocate fund towards? So we've learned and we're trying to sort of uh, pass this on. I know the eCell, the eCell, for instance, has something called a campus ambassador program where we have students in a number of campuses all over India who are eCell ambassadors. So we talk to them and then they in turn try to evangelize eCells in their campus. This is nationwide. CFI also does something similar. CFI is a little bit more tangible because there is actually a workshop there. So CFI's reach tends to be more in South India, uh, right? Because it's easier for us to travel, but again, it's not restricted to that. In parallel, the incubation cell is also trying to connect with incubators in other colleges. Essentially, again, saying two things. One, we'll support you. We've We've gone through, uh, you know, every time an incubate comes in, we sign something called an incubation agreement with them, right? And again, these things are not simple and they've gone through several iterations. I remember sitting, some startups coming and saying, I won't sign this agreement, right? It's a terrible one-sided agreement. And we went back to the drawing board saying, okay, what's one-sided about it? How can we tweak it? We've iterated a lot on our structures and processes and so on. And now we are sort of happy to share what we have with people. So you don't have to go through that same iteration again. So on the one hand, we are happy to partner people and just transfer knowledge. But on the other hand, we are also happy to co-incubate. You've got people in your, in your university uh, who are entrepreneurial in nature. They have an idea. You want to incubate them. Uh, but perhaps you don't have all the facilities required uh, to successfully incubate. So you offer, maybe you have the space, but you don't have the technical support, whatever it is, we'll co-incubate. Right? And some of our alumni mentors uh, could mentor you as well. I mean, and, and all of our alumni are very happy to mentor non-IIT Madras uh, you know, alumni, they just want to sort of see the nation being built in that sense. So um, I think we have about 12 colleges essentially in the south here that we have tied up with uh, people like Crescent Engineering College, Sona College, uh, Madurai Tyaga, uh, Tyagarajar College, uh, University, things like that, that we have uh, tied up with and we're sort of uh, working with them. Um, we're also learning some lessons, right? Because as we work with them, as we try to translate what we have, um, you know, we, we find that there are a few things that, um, that we would like universities to do. One of the, uh, it's easy to set up an entrepreneurship cell. In fact, I think everyone has it these days. I think the government gives you a little bit of a little bit of money. You have a room somewhere in the university, you put a board. There's maybe some faculty who, in addition to everything that they do, is assigned the entrepreneurship coordinator and you're done. That's easy, right? But that's not going to get you anywhere unless you have all of these other pieces. What we find is, and it's still very early days, so we don't really have any successes or failures or whatever, but we find that uh, in colleges where you do not have a strong innovation and in particular research environment, uh, naturally there is relatively little in terms of creative ideas coming up, right? Because people aren't thinking creatively, right? People are essentially, faculty are teaching courses that they've 
taught out of a textbook and the student's sole goal is to be able to crack that examination. Right? And so they're all, I mean, they're all smart and capable people, but they're orienting their thinking in this rather narrow manner. Right? Whereas in places where we see research happening, people tend to broaden their minds. They try to go outside of what's in the textbook because that's the definition of research. Right? It's, it's sort of coming up with something new. Um, so one of the things that I think universities ought to do, colleges ought to do, is start prioritizing research. And that is what drives uh, innovation. A backstory to all of this is when Shankar, and I, I mean, I'm f several, several years, more than a decade, younger to him in terms of uh, uh, being an alumnus at IIT. But while he was a student, while I was a student, there was relatively little research going on at IIT. Right? IIT was still primarily an undergraduate university teaching. At some point that changed. Uh, we brought in more people with PhDs doing research. Uh, and we started measuring people on the research that they did. So to get promoted, you needed to publish. And not just publish whatever, but publish in good quality journals, whatever. So it started creating a research culture where people came to IIT saying, I want to do research. That culture gestated for more than a decade, a decade and a half before it sort of transformed into this uh, entrepreneurial culture, right? So if we didn't have that research culture to start with, none of this would have happened, right? So I think it's very, very important to have that research and innovation culture. Part of it is faculty writing proposals and doing research. Uh, the other is restructuring your curriculum to make it a little bit more open-ended, doing more group projects rather than examinations, right? So that both faculty and students learn by doing something that's a little bit off the beaten path. So I think that's one learning uh, that we have. The second learning is that, again, I cannot say this enough, we would not have, I think, gotten, in my view, uh, right, and this is my personal view, we wouldn't even be at 50% of where we are if it had not been for our alumni, right? And it's, it's batches like Shankar's batch that funded us, and I'm not saying it just because he's moderating, I would have said it anyway. Uh, uh, and also all the alumni who just selflessly came together and said, we'll form this Entrepreneurs Forum, we are there for you, and walked the talk. Right? There are lots of people who will sign up for something and then they're not available. I mean, these guys were willing to put in uh, you know, hours of their own personal time in their, despite their busy schedules to help set up the ecosystem, work with startups, etc. Right? And um, it's, it turns out that alumni know a thing or two about business. Right? They need not have been entrepreneurs. But anyone who's been out for 15, 20 years has worked in the corporate world. I mean, they know a thing or two about running an organization, building a team. These are all valuable skills that they can impart. So I think it becomes very, very important for colleges and universities to start channeling their alumni. And in several cases, uh, there are universities that probably have no idea of who their alumni are, um, right? Probably don't keep track, um, you know, don't perhaps call them in. So I think the, the alumni relations part is critical. The innovation in teaching and research part is critical. And I think if, if universities or colleges can put these two together, the rest of it has a, a much better chance of falling in place. But this is sort of our experience, trying to take this out to other universities. Thank you, Ashwin. I, I hope uh, we actually record and send this message to all institutions who are maybe not even present here, because I think there is a great playbook over here which is articulated. And I can tell you on his behalf that any, any institution that wants to sort of pursue this, uh, there are enough and more avenues at IIT Madras who will work with them and, and, and transfer the knowledge to them. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the great things about this, I've been watching the audience, nobody has yawned so far. Okay, so that means it's, it's been interesting. I also think we should not push our luck. It's already 7 o'clock. We don't want to actually see people yawning. I just want to close with one small point, which is on disruption. Uh, some 10, 12 years ago, if I wanted an auto, There'll be some 10 of them standing in one corner. One MGR auto stand will be there. I'll have to go there. I'll have to argue with the three or four of them or the fair. Get into one. Taxi is even more difficult because the taxi stands are farther away. The Ubers and Olas totally disrupted that business, right? You would never think of going somewhere to get an auto. You would go to your phone instead. I think education, in a manner of speaking, has been done in the same way. I don't know. I mean, the last major change was when we moved from under the trees to a building. That was the last major change in education. After that, it's pretty much been the same thing. Education is ripe for disruption. There are people commercially trying to do it like the Baijus and so on. But I think as a centrally funded institution, IIT Madras has the responsibility and is executing the responsibility of coming up with this disruption to the manner in which education is being done. That is itself a technology. Though their job is to look at technologies, the art of teaching is itself a technology 
which itself has to be sort of explored and, and made better, which is what I think IIT is doing. So thank you for that, Ashwin. And thank you, IIT Madras. Ashwin, last question about you personally. What are your personal interests? What do, how do you keep yourself occupied in IIT? What is the breakup of your time between research, admin tasks, uh, any projects that you may get, uh, teaching? You have a number of things as you pointed out. What is the sort of breakup? How does a typical professor's time look like? Okay, so um, when, I, when I tell people I'm a professor at IIT, they assume I teach, and I do teach. Uh, but I teach roughly on average three to four hours a week. Okay, so that's less than an hour a day is what I teach typically. And that's not just me. Most of us, uh, we teach one to one and a half courses a semester and a course is about three hours a week. So it's three to four, four and a half hours. So I'd say less than 10% of my time goes into teaching. And, you know, uh, of course, people will say there's preparation, etc. But typically, we te we've taught this class a few times. We've got teaching assistants, all of that. So teaching is actually very, very little. And this, I think, is very, very different from many other engineering universities or, or colleges. And what this does is I still have now 90% of my time to do other stuff. Um, this actually varies, I think, in the early part of my career. Uh, about 70% of that time went into research because I was trying to build up um, you know, a research stream, a research lab, uh, a research pipeline, all of that. Um, and you know, in places like uh, IIT, everywhere else, you do a little bit of uh, administration. So you're on various committees, this, that. So I'd say the early part of my career, it was 10% teaching, 70% research, and about 10% on you know, projects with companies, 10% on administration. Um, off late, the amount of time I'm able to devote to research has come down, um, although you know, I still like to put in about 30-40% of my time into research, although that's becoming difficult. And more time goes into, um, uh, you know, actually working with companies, uh, more on the, on the consulting side, which is also partly research, but it's not as basic, it's more applied. But also to setting up systems at IIT. So I spent, I mean, of course, I've spent quite a bit of, the reason I'm able to articulate this is I've spent quite a bit of time doing this. It's not just me, there are dozens of other people who've contributed towards this picture, but that took time. Um, you know, today I'm trying to set up a new school of sustainability at IIT. So there are a number of, say, institute building activities that uh, we end up doing. So today it's a bit, the teaching stays at 10%. Um, it's sort of 25%, 25% on institute building and uh, sort of outside facing activities and about whatever, 40%, uh, 30, 40% on research. And your sporting interests are so significant, you must talk about them. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I'm a sports fanatic. I play, uh, I play tennis. I, I don't profess to play it at, at any, uh, you know, at any great level. But what was funny is I had a student who come, you know, came a few years ago and said, "Sir, I need a signature. Uh, can I come to the tennis courts?" Right. So I said, "Could you not first ask me if you could come to my office?" So the reputation I have with some of my students is I spend. It's easier to catch me on the tennis courts than it is uh, uh, than it is here. But I mean, I lots of other interests. Uh, you know, when I was at IIT, it was a great. I learned a lot of things. I played tennis. I used to quiz quite a bit as well, and all of those kinds of things. And I don't have as much time to do it, but whenever I can. Uh, so I'll put a small plug in. I don't know if uh, you are interested in. I see a number of students. If you are interested in quizzing. Um, one of the top quizzes in the country is the Sarang Lone Wolf Quiz, which is uh, next weekend on Saturday at the Open Air Theatre at IIT. Incidentally, it's the 25th anniversary of when I won the quiz. So I am uh, asking the opening question of the quiz. So if you guys are interested in quizzing, please come to the Open Air Theatre next Saturday on the 14th. The quiz traditionally starts at midnight and goes up till sunrise. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's really, uh, you know, 25 years ago, I was the only one who was awake at sunrise, and so essentially, that's why I ended up winning. But, but do come for that, for that, if you like. Yeah, and an open invitation, as he has pointed out, to everybody who's a student or not a student here, to look through the NPTEL website and see if there is something you find interesting. It's open for you to learn, right? You can never stop learning. So Ashwin, I think, uh, yeah, it's really well beyond time. Ashwin? One last question I had to ask you. At any stage in your career, were you ever asked if you wanted to be an actor? <laughs> and why did you turn it down? Okay. No, but the closest I got was, uh, you know, in 12th standard, when we had our farewell, the teachers gave us all names. And, uh, you know, the brainiest guy in the class was sort of gray cells galore or whatever. Mine was pantomime performer. 
right? And I never really <laughs> accosted my teachers to understand why, but that's the closest I've gotten to someone asking if I want, or someone suggesting that maybe I had a, an alternative career. But yeah, Thank no, you, no formal yeah. request. This was, a, this was a wonderful session. And as I said, it is something that uh, is worth being recorded and yeah. passed on to people. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Welcome. You. Welcome. Yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, good evening, Professor Ashwin. It's a very nice uh, way your presentation. You are taken in a very panoramic way of uh, entire uh, ideas to product and uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And also nice to know that uh, IIT Mem is giving a space for non-ITNs to uh, try their ideas and uh, this one to generate the new products. So, a couple of questions in that. Uh, one is like uh, so what you said, the people who just uh, make the product come out and go into a yeah, startups or entrepreneurship, uh, like they do based on the, some uh, new products and try to find a new markets, or they see some existing market which they can do some different uh, products or improved like that, or a uh, import substitution. That's uh, what is their main focus will be on. That is one. Second is uh, like uh, people who are going into uh, startups or new entrepreneurships. What is their uh, like uh, time or duration in which the progress they make is going to take off and become a successful or what's the point of time they get to know that it's a time that they have to go for course correction. Okay. Right. Thank you. So the short answer to both your questions is it depends. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, maybe I'll say a few other. So the first question, what, what kind of startups do they go after an existing market, etc.? I don't think our students or faculty look at it in that perspective. They take an idea that they that they like, that they worked on, and then try to sort of push that forward. And in that process, discover whether it's an import substitution based thing or whether it's, a, um, you know, it's an existing market that they're trying to disrupt or whatever it is, right? So it's the other way around. Um, they don't start with, uh, you know, let me look at, uh, you know, it's Atmar, but what can I import substitute? So it's a little bit, and therefore we've got a mix of, of uh, all of that. Uh, and the second question was uh, the timeline, right? Yeah, again, it depends. Uh, we have, like I said, a bio incubator. Biotech entrepreneurship takes sometimes decades, right? Because you have so many, there's research involved, there's clinical trials involved, you know, things like that. Um, apps, for instance, you can be up and running in three months, um, right? So it uh, depends a little bit. Uh, somehow, and this is due to the fact that uh, Aether Energy was one of our first startups. My colleagues, Krishnan Balasubramaniam, Prabhu Rajagopal, who are experts in non-destructive non -destructive testing, drones, robotics, etc., started up a few companies. Some of the, the first few companies were what we call deep tech startups. And therefore, somehow people just sort of thought, okay, IIT Madras is deep tech. And today we tend to have primarily deep tech and not as much uh, in terms of the app uh, kind of uh, startups as Shankar was also alluding to at the beginning. And for this, uh, you know, it roughly takes anywhere between two to three to five years, uh, depending on where you are. We have people like um, Agnikul that uh, Shankar mentioned and people who are essentially in space tech where, uh, you know, who knows when that market will really, uh, you know, materialize. So, but I'd say we are looking at anywhere from say about two years to you know, depending on the, and that's one of our challenges is to being able to support people through whatever time horizon they have. So although the incubation agreement we sign is for 18 months, the support we commit to is often far, uh, and that's also useful information I think for others interested in setting up an ecosystem in their universities. Is there no, there's no one size sort of fits all kind of template to this. Anybody else please? Uh, yes, please go ahead sir. Be, uh, please, only one question, be brief. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Professor. Uh, happy evening to all. Yeah, that uh, in this pandemic, right, in last two years, from the colleges, they were filing their patents up to publication level. Okay, that recently, uh, NIPM or IPR sectors, are, they launched some Kapila schemes also for uh, focusing the IPR sections. Okay, from college level, what I saw, from college level, that so many faculties and students are filing and publishing their uh, intellectual property or ideas, okay? How they need to commercialize their patents? There is any suggestions from your side? Uh, 
Yeah. Well, the process of commercialization is, uh, is reasonably well laid out. I mean, there are various stages you go through. At IIT, we have an IP cell with, uh, you know, some people with that techno-legal background, and that's something that uh, other universities can think of setting up, right, which will sort of just ease that process so that, uh, you know, the, the paperwork is done by the cell, but the research is done by the faculty. But here's the thing. I think today, patents by themselves, I mean, it's nice to sort of see, but it's going to probably cost you more to maintain the patent, right, than, than what it will, what, than the revenue that you generate out of the patent, because there's this sort of myth that once you have patents, companies will just come look through, you know, take a patent, buy it from you, or lease it from you, or whatever, and that doesn't quite happen. So the onus is on the faculty, right, to actually also take it all the way towards commercialization and not keep it uh, sort of uh, staying as a patent. And this is, I think, a mind shift that needs to be uh, changed because a lot of times I find faculty saying, I've done my job. I've innovated, here's a patent, um, right? And you know, you really aren't really pushing the entrepreneurial envelope far enough. So I would say patents are a good start because that means somebody's doing something creative, right? But now that you have that start, you've got to sort of look at these other programs that can, uh, that can sort of incentivize faculty to push this forward. So for instance, maybe there is a scholarship available right, for a student to work with a faculty who already has a patent to commercialize that patent, right? That's where you're, that way you're sort of guaranteed to get at least a few students who work with that faculty. You know, the patent may not be of great commercial value. It may, you know, we don't know, but at least you have a pipeline going forward. So I'd suggest you think a little bit more about, let's not be satisfied that we have patents, right? That's great from a, from a ranking metric perspective, but is not really going to push the entrepreneurial thing by itself, although it is, it's, it's as we say in, in mathematics, no, it's necessary but not sufficient. So can you tell me which institution you are from so that you'll be able to appreciate? You are yeah. from? Yeah, I am not from institution. I am heading knowledge exchange community as well as academic to IT. I am the visiting professor the two more colleges in Tamil Nadu. I am recommending you know, uh, that faculties and students, nearly yeah. we developed from us that nearly we have 20 plus products where we help the students and faculties you know, to make the products as well and also we are helping them to connect with the startup tn that innovation voucher program as well as no yeah. uh, this funding agencies from the government yeah. even the serb and very good yeah people, thanks like anybody that. else please uh, we will yes. move on to Thank yeah you. there is a lady there please <coughs> go ahead madam can you please introduce yourself which college you represent uh, sir iit is a premier institute with bundle of opportunities for the students sir. But uh, my question is, what is the opportunity available for a second or for a third layer of engineering college student where he don't have a very big uh, backup of alumna, they don't have very big funds, and they don't have very big opportunities. So how much opportunities and support is there? And I also have one more question that uh, there's a pre-notion now that government is uh, indirectly stressing or pressurizing all education institutions to have an incubation center to reduce their pressure of being unemployed. Okay. So what would you like to comment about it? Yeah, well, the second one I think is, uh, I don't really know if I have something meaningful to say on it. I, I think the government has, um, has some good reasons to set up incubation cells to the uh, extent that it will actually uh, <coughs> prevent unemployment. I think there are lots of ways to look at it, so maybe I won't answer that. But the first one, which you asked, which is what, what options are there for a tier two, tier three university person? I'll give you a very simple um, you know, thing that they can do. Every year, IIT Madras now holds this thing called an e-summit, an entrepreneurship summit, which essentially is an entrepreneurship festival for, it's an, it's an intercollegiate entrepreneurship festival, just like Shastra, which is a technical festival, whatever. Any student from any college can register, right? And I believe I, I'm, it's in, I think it's in March this year or in early April. I think you can sort of Google and, and find out. So students from tier two, tier three colleges interested in entrepreneurship, I would suggest that they, rec they, they register for the entrepreneurship summit at IIT Madras, come spend three days <coughs> on campus. They listen, at the very least, they listen to a bunch of talks day in and day out. There are a number of workshops that they can register and participate in. There are also competitions, and there are competitions for people with various levels of maturity. If you have an idea, you want to pitch it, there's a competition. If you don't have an idea, we'll give you a hypothetical situation where you can put yourself in an entrepreneur's shoes and 
try to get you to strategize what that entrepreneur should be doing. So at least you understand a little bit of what those constraints are. So the choice is open to the student irrespective of his or her, her interest, they can chart a course. So I would say they should start off with things like that. Um, second step might be to then become a, a campus ambassador in their college, so affiliate with our entrepreneurship cell. Uh, maybe slowly. I don't think setting up an entrepreneurship cell should have anything to do with the, whether you're a tier one university or a tier two or a tier three. Um, you know, I think it's really more about who can take the initiative and get something going. So, so that's how I would start if, if I had a, an enthusiastic student. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for us, it's open to everybody, right? So anybody can come. You can register, come and, uh, you know, and, and sort of enlighten yourself. So... One last question okay. from the audience, then we Just move on to the online question. Vijay, one, one quick yes, please. response to it. There's something called an IIT Madras incubator, which was there on the slide, right? Uh, more than 50% of the companies yeah. which are incubated in the incubator are not of IIT Madras origin, not even of IIT origin. They are from other. So it, it is a very inclusive system. You just have to have a good idea and you will find a place then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now we'll move to the online question. Uh, I think, thank you. For 850 people are watching this online and uh, good numbers. We got a couple of questions. Maybe one or two questions. I'll place it before, uh, we'll, before we let you go, sir. Uh, here's a question from Ram Murthy. He says, sir, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is to be established independent of the curriculum or part of the curriculum, sir, because the course content of our institution is so tough and how do you integrate the entrepreneurial system in the course curriculum to make the student aware and get involved in entrepreneurial? That is a fantastic question. It's a problem we also dealt with because some of our students came and said we are really interested, we want to be in Nirman and all of this. But I have six courses and three labs to take. And uh, you know each professor is tougher than the next, right? And they're giving us assignments, when do I have time? So there is, so we do have to find some solutions to this. Couple of solutions are uh, one, some universities offer, uh, you know, we used to call them independent study kind of credits or uh, uh, I think different universities call it differently, but you can affiliate with a professor on a project and both of you can decide what that project is. So that's one way of doing it. In some cases, your final year project that almost everyone has to do can be oriented more towards entrepreneurship. Um, and I think it's also important to start offering entrepreneurship courses in the curriculum, which I didn't talk much about, but which we also do, because then a student can take the entrepreneurship course, and therefore one out of the six courses is already this, and therefore the work that they are doing can be submitted as the project for that course or whatever it is. But it's, I think, important. So these are some ways that we've experimented, but I think it's very important. Otherwise, having students go through a rigorous program and do entrepreneurship is really not going to work. Excellent. Uh, here's a Kushi from Chennai, uh, she's again a student and uh, something similar to what the madam asked, he says, interesting uh, come to the you know, uh, research, what do, come for research uh, institution like you, what do they really look at the institutions uh, to opt for, uh, for the research work? Because IIT is a great brand so that easily attracts uh, big companies to come and do research there. What do the try to try three city colleges to do to attract research work in the institution? I think you mentioned PhDs. A lot of this has to be done. Yeah, I, so I think if I understand the question correctly, it's sort of saying, look, at IIT, it's easy for you to attract a company yes. to come in. What do I do for tier two, tier three? Yes. Um, well, it's, of course, it's difficult, but I think one is to build some expertise, right, in, in, in a particular area. Because once you have some amount of expertise, that expertise will be valuable to somebody, um, right? And more and more, I see companies wanting to work locally, um, right? So rather work in their backyard rather than, you know, travel, over hills and valleys to come to an IIT or whatever to work with. So if you have, so I think it's important that the university or the department has a vision and say, I want to strengthen myself in these areas. So, you know, as a civil engineer, I want to strengthen myself in concrete technology specifically. Start recruiting some faculty, start pushing some research in that area so you, you build that capability. Then you slowly start working with the cement manufacturers, for instance, in your area and slowly start building outwards from there. Um, right? So I think there has to be a strategy, a vision that each department in each university has to have to build some local capability 
and then uh, attract local industry. And it's so, so if you have cement industries next to you, great. If you have automotive industries next to you, then maybe your mechanical engineering department needs to specialize a little bit more on manufacturing processes or whatever it is. So I think you've got to align with local industry and that's the way to start. Excellent, sir. I'll take two last questions uh, before we close is and Mr. Al uh, Albert from Pondicherry. Sir, Wacom in identifying, you mentioned uh, Wacom in identifying professional engineers today is tough and uh, is it uh, because of the placement culture which big IT companies and uh, take you know, big numbers, employ them and they all become a body bag in their organization. How do we achieve the dream of Atman Nirbar, put it in the mind of the students that it's better to look for entrepreneurship rather than go for a work? Well, I think you'll need to organize a complete new seminar to discuss that. So, I, <laughs> But all I will say is, uh, IT is, uh, uh, earlier, 10, 15 years ago, there was this accusation that the TCSs and the Infosys came and recruited everyone. Now we're seeing very little of that. We're seeing all kinds of companies come in. Um, engineering companies do come in as well. I think it's a little bit more, uh, the picture is a little bit more mixed today. Um, but it turns out that a lot of the traditional engineering companies, um, you know, students have more options today. So they, they sort of gravitate towards a number of different options. But like I said, I think that's a topic that we can discuss ad infinitum, and I don't want to take it up at 725 uh, at the moment. But yeah, there is, um, yeah, we'll just sort of leave that, leave it there if that's okay. Thank you. One last question, sir, we will let you go. And this is from Mr. Batmanaban. Sir, at one stage, uh, uh, an entrepreneur won't even get a girl to get married. Is the trend changed now with the way you work with so many entrepreneurs? How do we convince the parents to appreciate the entrepreneurial ecosystem to permit the children uh, to take entrepreneurship because their dream is that son should pass out of IIT and get a very big job, big fat salary in US or UK or any other interest? Well, uh, if you were brave enough to be an entrepreneur, then you're probably not the kind of person who's asking your parents uh, as to who you should get married to is sort of, I think, how I would put this, uh, right? But, but I think, uh, you know, jokes apart, the perception is changing. I know this was exactly an issue some time ago, saying, uh, do you have a job? Do you have a, uh, you know, it wasn't just entrepreneurs. I mean, I know my wife's a lawyer, so I know that even, you know, these lawyers doing independent practices had uh, difficulty um, sort of finding spouses because they didn't necessarily have a steady job. Even today, I think uh, certain professions find it difficult to get credit cards and so on because you don't have that security of being part of a company. But I think on to the, the, uh, at least among young people, the perception of entrepreneurship is changing completely. I think it is now far cooler to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think people sort of see the benefits of even being a failed entrepreneur. Uh, because you learn, you learn a lot more two years as an entrepreneur than you would perhaps 10 years in a large organization. So people I think are seeing, are seeing the benefits and they're sort of making choices uh, very differently today, um, uh, you know, than earlier. So I think, and also people realize that, uh, uh, you know, failure is not sort of the end of it, right? So you can always find other career paths, etc. So uh, I had a conversation with some uh, second year students not too long ago saying, what do you guys want to do after you graduate? And 100% of them said, we want to either be entrepreneurs or we want to work with an entrepreneur. So that's the aspiration today, right? And I think that's a very healthy sign to say that the perception towards entrepreneurship is this positive among uh, the young generation in first, second year in college. So I think, you know, getting married will be the least of their problems. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause to Ashwin right. for so beautifully bringing out uh, such a complex subject. and. Uh, I also want to share with you, about two weeks back, MMA organized a talk by one of the senior vice chancellors, how to develop a research ecosystem in your institution. It's, I think you must watch it. It's a very beautifully position, how you must do that. Because he correctly mentioned, the research ecosystem is very, very good to bring an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And thank you, Ms. Shankar, for really facilitating, you know, leading the conversation. And uh, you please share it with your friends. All these recordings are available. We'll also send it to all the educational institutions. Do share it to educational institutions so that Everybody gets the benefit out of this one. So, ladies and gentlemen, again, a big round of applause to Ashwin. Now, I request Shankar to please present a memento on behalf of NMA.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for your presence and uh, look forward to see you again tomorrow. Good night until we meet again. Bye-bye.